Now that we're men, we can do anything. Now that we're men, we are invincible. Now that we're men, we'll go to shows where we get the crown, save the town and Mr. Krabs. Now that we're men, we have facial hair. Now, now that we're men, men, I change my underwear. Now, now that we're men, we got a man we wear. We got, got the stuff we're tough enough to save the day. We, we never, never had a chance for rearing kids! No, no, no! Let's we'll take a look at what the mermaid did! Ha, ha, ha! Patrick, Conscious and Slappy! Tentacles enveloped our shoulders, more than we could count, each quivering suction cup attaching to our flesh painfully and pushing us forward. There, there, nothing but a spot of dirt, just some good-natured roughhousing between boys, eh? His sigh was jittery. Goodness, this is trickier than I expected, but worry not, dwarfish brave ones. We'll be at the training ground in three stones no longer. Three stones? I mumbled. Apologies, apologies. Blinky whisked us into the dark tunnel through which Jack had vanished. Stones are a troll measurement of time. It's quite literal. Three stones being the amount of time it takes an average troll to eat three stones. In other words, not long at all. You eat rocks? Not if it can be avoided. It's a bitter meal for the sophisticated palate. But culinary preferences are of little consequence right now. Hurry along. Blinky's eyes emitted a pale red light, just enough for us to see by. Up ahead, we heard the jangling of Jack's armor. He wasn't waiting for us to catch up, that was for sure. What's more... I no longer wanted to catch up. Maybe my uncle had been valiant in saving my father from a life beneath the world's surface, but the forty-five years spent down here had twisted his mind, turned him into a madman. I put on the brakes and held back Tub with an arm. Feckless little leprechauns! Blinky cried. Your temerity shall be the death of me! Oh, why do I allow this life of conflict to interrupt the cozy solitude of the scholar? Favor me, runt animals, by continuing on. Explain, I said. That's all I ask. At full volume, Blinky's scornful tone was plenty intimidating. My emotional state is not to be trifled with! The Killaheed Bridge, Gunmar the Black, I said. We can't protect ourselves from that psycho up there if we don't know what you're even talking about. Tub held on to my waist like a drowning man. Our father, he mumbled, who harks from heaven, shank us this day some daily bread. Tub, I hissed, you're Jewish. I know, he hissed back. That's why I don't know the damn words. Arg growled from behind us. Her hot breath dampened our necks. Explain, I said. 
bracing myself against an outcropping of brick. And forgive us our bread, Tub continued, as we forgive those who bred against us. Blinky recoiled his tentacles. With dry rustles, they twisted, untwisted, and laced into patterns the meaning of which I couldn't begin to guess. Ooze hung from his pores in beads. The effect was like that of a great inhale. Very well. You do, after all, have standing before you the foremost living authority on troll movement in America. But hark, young scamps, my explanations come with two conditions. Condition one, that I might save time by quoting liberally from my unfinished 11,000-page, 38-volume dissertation, Troll Migration from the Old World and Suggestions for Future Growth and Sustainable Materials, featuring an account of the Great Gum Gum War in America and appendices on Euro-American troll type, size, smell, and hue. Condition two, that we keep locomoting in this direction during the education. The night is not infinite in length. All agreed? Sure, fine. Start talking. I nudged Tub. He's going to tell us stuff. Tub sniffled from where he nuzzled my armpit. Amen, he concluded. Chapter 20 Trolls have existed on this planet for as long as humans. This is what I was told and what I translated to Tub. The first mention of them in recorded history is from 9th century Norway, when the nefarious creatures began showing up in song, verse, and bedtime stories to keep misbehaving children in line. According to Norse folklore, trolls are one of the dark beings, the purest embodiments of evil, and they scurried from between the toes of Emir, the mythic six-headed frost giant whose murdered body became the universe in which we live. His bones became the mountains, his teeth boulders, and so forth. This origin, Blinky said, is considered a fairy tale by modern trolls. Some even bristle at the very word troll, derived from an ancient Norse word meaning one who walks clumsily. Regardless of what you call them, there is little doubt that human civilization after the Ice Age was frequently interrupted by the six varieties of troll mountain, forest, sea, water, farm, and holder folk, all of whom held great hatred in their hearts for the humans who ruined the forests, fields, and rocks that had long been the trolls' domains. Thankfully, humans also built plenty of bridges, structures so laden with symbolism, the crossing from one place to another, that trolls were able to use them as shortcuts into the underworld. All bridges? I asked Blinky. Yes, he said. Even footbridges? I asked. Yes, he said. What if I just laid a plank over a hole? Would that work? I asked. You need to let me finish this story, he replied rather sternly. Trolls also had the ability to come and go from beneath the beds of innocence, for all means and purposes, this meant children, though these gateways were less practical than bridges for numerous reasons. If the child was deep in sleep, for example, trolls could become infected with their dreams, resulting in something like the flu, the severity of which would depend on what kind of dream it was. Though rare, human children, too, could use these doorways. Despite these cunning entryways into our world, Trolls had limited ways to fight. Sunlight turned them into stone, so their retaliation against humans was relegated to evening hours. Stories from the ninth century feature trolls protecting their habitats by any means necessary, often focusing their aggression on churches, which were, quite simply, convenient gathering spots for humans. One activity that brought trolls endless amusement 
was tossing boulders at these churches, this undying wrath, more than any inherent flavor, made human meat the most prized of all troll dishes. But for as long as there have been human-eating trolls, there have been humans to fight them. The Sturgeon Sturgis family were the subjects of many a ballad, hymn, and shanty, armed with sword and bow and shields painted with their crest, esse quam videri, b, do not seem. They defended their camps from troll attacks before adopting the more proactive stance of flushing trolls from their hiding spots. From this lineage rose several celebrated warriors. In 1533, Ragnar Sturgeon used his teeth to bite the head off a troll to save whales from an invasion of mugglewumps. In 1666, Rosalind Sturgeon was partly responsible for the Great Fire of London while fending off a horde of large Irish bat mugs. Possibly the most controversial was Theobald Sturgis, who rescued a battalion of English soldiers during the Battle of Mons from a pack of Gizcolders who attempted to burrow upward through the trenches. Damn, Tubb said after translation. Ragnar is a cool ass name. Trolls spread like fire across the Eurasian continent. Iceland, Sweden, Finland, Germany, France, and Scotland were the locations of the most storied underworld kingdoms, though troll populations rose up as far away as China. However, as recently as the early 17th century, and seeing how trolls can live for up to a thousand years, that's pretty recent, there was not a single troll on American soil. That changed when a ship called the Mayflower set off from Plymouth, England on September 6, 1620, carrying an official list of 130 passengers. Human passengers, that is. As for the unaccounted trolls hiding in the cargo section, it is anyone's guess. Estimates range from two dozen to triple digits, especially if you count the green furry-tailed gremlins which could easily pack thirty to a barrel. Not that any serious scholar would bother counting gremlins, of course. The Mayflower trolls were not just courageous explorers willing to risk life and limb on a perilous voyage across a sunlit ocean, but also staunch separatists. A philosophical argument had riven the troll communities of the British Isles into two factions. Most kept a traditional conservative view of troll-human relations that is, humans would continue to spoil the natural resources the trolls held dear, and the trolls, in return, would eat the humans. But a splinter group led by Ebenezer Arg of the Lincolnshire Args believed that this relationship was not only unsustainable, but immoral, and promoted to his believers a program of better living through four-legged consumption. Abolished were the tender main courses of human children. Gone were the spicy after-dinner snacks of human sausage straight from the smokehouse. Forbidden were the breakfast treats of sugared old person skin. These trolls favored rabbits, squirrels, raccoons, rats, certain varieties of bird, and the occasional seasonal cat. Are there any vegetarian trolls? I asked. In fact, for a time there was a sect called the Nilbogians, replied Blinky, who believed that trolls could live on plant matter alone. It was a most virtuous experiment, though after nineteen days every Nilbogian spontaneously dissolved into a puddle of green slime. No sooner had they landed in America than the separatist trolls fled the Mayflower by night and found bridges beneath which they could enter the underworld and begin to build livable homes. The eastern seaboard flourished with fertile cave ground, and the trolls spread to new quarters in their characteristic fashion, slowly but steadily. No sooner would a new bridge be inaugurated than a troll and its family would take residence beneath it. Few trolls made the dangerous trek to the west, and fewer made it alive, but many of those who did found themselves drawn to quiet San Bernardino, the cupped hand of God. 
At last, trolls had found a temperate home that did not require the stocking of food for long winters. The Sturgis family arrived in the New World not fifty years after the trolls, settling first in Boston and Maine. The American Sturgises, however, found themselves without reason to fight the peaceful Euro-American trolls, and over time their warrior lifestyle was overtaken by pursuits far more useful for a developing nation. The art of tannery, the brewing of ale, the growing of soybeans, and, much later, the perfection of the calculator pocket. Three hundred and fifty years passed with little more kerfluffle than the occasional irate cat owner. Then something happened that changed the course of troll human history forever. In 1967, the London Bridge, which ran across the River Thames and was the busiest hub of traffic in that great city, was disassembled and shipped in its entirety over 5,000 miles away to Lake Havasu City, Arizona. Absurd though this may seem, it is true. A rich engineer purchased the London Bridge as a tourist attraction to bring people to his out-of-the-way real estate development. The Arizona reconstruction took over three years to complete, but it took only an hour for the trolls who'd stowed away inside the bridge segments to escape. Upon landing in Arizona, the inhabitants of London Bridge tore apart their crates and fled into the night. By January of 1968, they had crossed the California border and set about doing what old world trolls did best, eating children. This treacherous tribe, made up of all the worst elements of every troll family in Europe, was collectively known as the Gum Gums. Gum Gums? Tub repeated. That's probably the least scary name I've ever heard. Imagine what we think of Dershowitz, Blinky replied. This comment I didn't bother to translate. The Gum Gums had terrorized the Eurasian continent for well over a thousand years. They were first mentioned in a parchment addressed to King Constantine II, circa 920 A.D., wherein they were described as horrid and of putrid breath and hoggish in their appetites. In the 1100s, the Gum Gums descended from the Scottish Highlands and just 100 years later were known to have taken possession of every single bridge in Londinium under the barbaric command of their ageless leader, Gunmar the Black. It is believed that Gunmar chose to center his clan in San Bernardino specifically to spite the self-satisfied pacifists who populated the local underworld. Whatever the reason, he and his minions wasted no time stealing children. One per month for the first three months, then one per week. By the time 1969 began, several children were disappearing every week in San Bernardino, each one of them dragged screaming to a hidden underground labyrinth and caged for weeks before being grilled over an open flame and eaten. American trolls had lost their instinct for fighting and allowed the Gum Gum Blitz to continue for far too long. At last, the American tribes gathered for a wapentake, an ancient Viking tradition whereupon the leaders of each clan, from the Bluzbumps to the Kiltillians, turned over their weapons so that they might speak toward a common goal. Together, they admitted the consequences of not getting involved, a new war between trolls and humans on the continent they'd worked so hard to keep neutral. Fortunately, they had strong numbers and a stronger leader. At the tender age of seventy-five, she was yet a child, but already possessed of a strong will, an optimistic outlook, and an aptitude for adventure. Her name was Johanna M. Arg. What's the M stand for? I asked. Mmm, Blinky replied. Johanna M. Arg would lead an army of trolls on a hunt for the gum gum lair. With great pomp and fanfare, they dug up chests containing some of the most prized possessions in all trolldom. 
ancient astrolabes that, according to lore, had been gifted by the fairy folk of Lower Scandinavia after a tribe of snick-snuck trolls rescued a coterie of fairies from torture at the hooves of a deranged fawn. Guided by these mystical compasses, the trolls began searching for the gum-gums. At the same time, an up-and-coming scribe and record-keeper of the Lizgump clan, who went by the name of Blinky, was tasked with the study of genealogical scrolls in hopes of locating a human paladin who could aid them in their oncoming battle. Day and night, Blinky scoured eight scrolls at once, devoting one eye per scroll, until the strain was so great that, one by one, the eyes went blind but not before discovering a family of Sturgises right there in San Bernardino. Sorry you lost your eyesight, I said. Indeed, it was a happenstance most disagreeable, Blinky replied, seeing how I was but a lad of forty-four in four hundred years. I, of course, devote a full volume of my dissertation to this tragedy. The drafting of a paladin was considered a great risk. Living in peace beneath humans was one thing, but fighting alongside one? It had never been done. But with the milk carton epidemic in full swing, it was a necessary gamble. So it was that on September 21, 1969, Jack Sturgis was taken against his will into Troll City where he rapidly matured into a prominent warrior. With Jack working in tandem with Arg, the troll army ransacked the Gum Gum Lair. While Jack single-handedly dispatched dozens of lesser trolls and commanded his legion of warriors with unflagging vigor, it was Johanna Arg who took on the Hungry One. It was a battle long in the making, Eleven hundred years earlier, Gunmar had lost an arm to Ramara Arg, Johanna's grandmother, in a fantastic midnight skirmish along the Austria-Hungary border. Since that night, Gunmar had not only sworn his revenge, but had also begun to notch each kill on the makeshift wooden arm he'd rammed into his still bleeding stump. The first wave of the onslaught was bleak. Gunmar, a beast so indescribably awful that he cannot at this particular moment be described, toyed with Johanna Arg. It was only when Gunmar embedded a boulder in the hairy troll's cranium that the tide began to change. Instead of killing Johanna Arg, the injury seemed to squash whatever small amount of hesitation existed in her brain. She became an uncontrollable, rampaging beast who came at Gunmar in a tornado of teeth, claws, and fur. One of Gunmar's eyes, the Eye of Malevolence, was torn out in the fray. Soon Gunmar fell, his minions were killed or captured, and it was left to Jack, the human hero, to deliver the killing blow to the Hungry One. Exhausted of bloodshed, Jack instead banished Gunmar into isolation among the deepest of Earth's caves. Gunmar slunk away, swearing revenge upon Jack, Johanna, Arg, and all of their offspring. These curses were difficult to understand, for Gunmar was chewing upon his tongue in rage. Every sound he released hissed like a serpent. Jack's mercy was a success in one sense. The remaining gum-gums swore to switch to a four-legged diet and enlisted in several eleven-step programs to keep them on the non-human eating wagon. Festivity reigned in the Troll Kingdom for months. As a sign of respect, trolls began referring to Johanna by her last name alone, and parent trolls would hold up their babies when ARG passed by so that the young ones could touch the boulder still sticking out of the back of her skull. That chunk of bedrock remains there to this day, Blinky said. It is the reason for my friend's impaired speech. Arg agreed. Rock 
make unhappy talk. What Jack realized too late was that he'd doomed himself to a subterrestrial life. His mercy had been a distinctly human thing. No troll would have hesitated to destroy Gunmar, and so he felt a responsibility to keep watch should Gunmar ever return. If Jack returned to the human world, he would grow older, and eventually the doorways to the troll world would be lost to him. He would need to stay young to defend against Gunmar, and the only way to do that was to remain underground. Jack, forever thirteen, trained every day, every year, ever watchful, ever paranoid. He was the only one not surprised several months before when the Eye of Malevolence showed them Gunmar's slow trek back from the bowels of the earth. Jack had made speeches in Troll City, but nobody listened. The trolls there had become fat, complacent, consumed with their food and trinkets, and certain that nothing like the gum-gum war could happen again. So defensive efforts were up to Jack, Blinky, and Arg. As Gunmar's power grew, Jack decided with great regret that Jim would have to be tested for paladin potential. But Jack had figured on having months, even years, to properly train his nephew. Now, with the news of a bridge being reconstructed in the San Bernardino Historical Society Museum, those months and years had been shaved down to mere days. The Killaheed Bridge had been the ancestral home of Gunmar the Black in the far northern region of Scotland, known in Gaelic as Agailtach. It is where he murdered every blood relative, erasing his surname in favor of the Black, and began the Gum Gum Cult with himself as the principal deity. The bridge was the nexus of his ancient power, and its shipment from across the ocean toward California must be what was powering his quick regeneration and drawing weak-minded trolls, a new army of gum gums, back under his influence. For months, trolls had been infiltrating San Bernardino at night and creating havoc. Nothing so far as abduction, not yet, but Jack, Blinky, and Arg had been kept busy enough that they'd had little chance to search out Gunmar himself. It had been a gamble revealing themselves to Jim and, inadvertently, Tub. But in war, such wagers were necessary. This was the lot of the troll hunters. Troll hunters. I couldn't help smiling a little. I liked the sound of it. Chapter 21 Jack waited for us in an unlit clearing with the burlap sack over his shoulder. The clay wall before him was cracked to reveal patches of intricate tile mosaics and begrimed frescoes created by troll artists of yesteryear. Entering this clearing from the tunnel was like traveling from throat to stomach. The rumble of motor vehicles, somewhere far above us, completed the illusion. He seemed smaller inside that scrap metal armor than he had before, more the dimensions of an adolescent boy than an inscrutable devil. Surely he had heard our approach, yet he did not react. I was about to say something when I noticed a group of trolls off to the right. Tub and I skittered aside, but Blinky and Arg showed no alarm. In fact, in their strange faces, I saw pity. It was the same routine I'd seen in the Red Light District. These trolls stood in a trance before a leaning tower of flickering half-busted TVs, their faces pressed to the sets, their long tongues lapping at the screens. Do not stare, Blinky said. It is a lamentable sight. What's with you guys and TVs? I asked. Blinky spoke in a hush. Do not be quick to judge, small-brained one. There is no sun in the life of a troll, indeed scarce little light at all. 
Is it any wonder that we cherish your televisions? That some of us even worship them like primitive man worshipped his sun gods? Ra, Helios, Apollo, Sol Invictus, Huitzilopochtli? His tentacles rippled heartily. There is not a troll alive who possesses fewer than two sets. What shows do you guys like? What you would consider lacking in entertainment value, we prefer. Commercials, in fact, are prized among us for their accelerated pace and bright colorings. Nothing, though, satisfies like pure static. Should you find time to study this liquid weave, you will discover beauty, divinity. So many sifting layers, so many patterns of meaning, so many whispered secrets. Drool poured from the slack mouths of at least two of the mesmerized trolls. So it's like a drug? I asked. It is precisely a drug. The calming effect is unlike anything else, and it is perfectly healthy in moderation. Today's troll experiences almost daily televisual contact. Nurses use them to ease the dementia of the elderly. Mothers use them to quiet their brood. I myself once spent a period of years riveted by an extraordinary signal from a faraway place called the BBC. I like to think that it contributed to the melodious harmonics of my voice. It did, I said. Trust me. But I am one of the fortunate. Like any drug taken in excess, it can ruin a mind. Those poor souls there will give every coin they have to try new signals, better signals, any signal at all, and while doing so will forget to eat, forget to drink, forget to excrete their waste. It is no coincidence that many cemeteries are located near static dens. Why doesn't it affect people that way? Doesn't it, dear boy? All right, I see what you're saying, but why? Jack slapped the brick with his right hand and snarled without turning around. You ask too many questions. Why this? Why that? How does it all work? What does it all mean? Down here? Things are what they are. You better get used to it. Or better yet, stop caring. Because there will never be enough answers to satisfy you, and even if there were, we don't have the time. 